let's turn to the issues of FCC compliance in the security space. And there are some big questions over where the market is heading and how to manage the dynamic risk environment. So there's been a lot of deep thinking over whether FCC risk can be effectively managed. And to explain it all of this, we're joined by Daniel Tanabam, Partner America's anti-financial crime practice and global head of sanctions at Oliver Wyman. Daniel, it's very good to see you and welcome to Cybos TV. But look, let's look at this from a financial crime standpoint. Where do you see at the most significant risks that firms should be aware of insofar as it relates to securities? No, absolutely, and, and very happy to be with you guys, albeit virtually today. Uh, firstly, and I'm thinking with a U.S. lens, there's still some regulatory uncertainty in the security space with respect to financial crimes compliance. So broker dealers and banks have been obliged to have an anti-money laundering compliance program for decades, but registered investment advisors or their administrators don't have the same obligations. And for whatever reason, for nearly 20 years, investment advisors have been held to a different standard. And you might ask, what is the risk exactly? And the risk is that firms that bank and transact with these investment advisors may not have a clear grip on whose funds they're actually holding um, because they're not obliged to have a full-fledged know your customer program. They're not actually obliged to know their, their customers. So if you're a custodian um, for one of these investment advisors, you end up running the risk that you may be holding funds ultimately for individuals or entities that run afoul of the law potentially or, or certainly your risk appetite. Now, another risk is also born out of the earlier conflict uh, that began with Russia and their annexation of Crimea in 2014 when the U.S. and its allies began designating Russian nationals. A number of the oligarchs that were designated over the last few years owned a myriad of businesses, and not all of those businesses were named um, and designated as businesses that you were banned from dealings with. So it was critical to ensure that you were linking your beneficial ownership controls with your sanctioned screening program, as even though a company may itself not be a blocked entity, uh, it, as a consequence of being owned by a designated person, that taints the, the overall picture. And, and lastly, it, it is important to note that securities financial crime risk doesn't differ that dramatically from traditional banking. So if you take a traditional trade-based money laundering scheme, money is laundered through the purchase and sale of illicit goods execute, executed through a gatekeeper who provide access to a market. If you take the example of black market peso exchanges, a bad actor will send their dirty US dollar proceeds through a peso broker to buy and sell illicit goods. And that bad actor eventually gets those pesos back from the broker laundering the dirty, the dirty dollars. In the security space, you can take the equivalent of mirror trades. And similar to the trade-based money laundering example, a bad guy will use a broker, in this instance, a securities broker, to access a financial market. And in this case, that securities market will be able to allow you to buy and sell securities. This market offers an almost identical setup to quickly integrate large sums of dirty cash into illicit assets, uh, notably securities and the ability to move that value across jurisdictions. So just to make clear, you know, on the, the implementation of the risks may take on different means, but the principles of financial crime risk are still the same. What would you say the, the best practices, Daniel, as it relates to sanctions risk management in the securities space? So firstly, it's critical to identify securities linked to individuals, companies, and beneficial owners so they can be added to a, a do not trade list, for instance. And there's a number of vended options that provides such a service. Understanding the linkages between issuers and securities are table stakes at this point, mostly from a sanction standpoint, but also as it relates to AML issues, such as dealing with politically exposed persons. And secondly, and this may sound like motherhood and apple pie, but you need to have an automated manner to perform regular screening against your securities master file. You need to screen any new customer and their associated trades, checking the QCIPs, you also need to screen customers and securities against updates to watch lists to ensure that even though someone or something might have been good when you onboarded them or began doing business with them, the situations, as we've seen over the last few months, can certainly change quite rapidly. But we know that settlement times are speeding up, so how can you best decide where you should situate those controls from a pre- and post-settlement perspective? 
So especially for controls such as sanctions or other nameless screening to be effective, pre-trade control execution is critical. And with clearing time settling almost instantaneously, are your systems quick enough to be able to enable you to conduct your compliance obligations without losing a competitive edge? Now, AML risk is generally lower in the security space, so sanctions will be a heavy focus. Sanctions, at least in the U.S., are strict liability regulations, meaning that if a violative transaction occurs because of control designs in a risk-based manner, that isn't an effective defense to eliminate any enforcement risk. Now, that being said, mitigants are considered uh, such as a risk-based design program as part of a defense if something goes wrong, but you really have to focus on as much pre-trade compliance control checks uh, as you can to ensure that nothing bad happens that you could be on the hook for. Are the regulators of the uh, security space heavily focused on the FCC risks that exist in the sector? So it, it's not that regulators aren't focused uh, on securities related FCC risks. Given the technicality of the products, not all are equipped to really dig in. For years, payment related risks dominated the focus for monitoring transactions for suspicious activity or sanctions related risks. It's important to note that Outside of FINRA in the U.S., there is limited FCC guidance in the security space. For instance, the Financial Action Task Force, the FATF guidance for the security sector, hasn't been updated in four years. And OFAC, my former employer at the U.S. Treasury Department, hasn't put out specific and comprehensive securities guidance since 2008. Now, certainly there were FAQs related to the original sectoral sanctions on Russia in 2014, but there is limited guidance on best practice that really exists in the market. And Daniel, we've talked about the risk to financial institutions in relation to FCC and securities, but are there other risks to players in the space that service pro providers should start considering, or certainly at least now? So I think first you have to think about broader reputational risk. That probably takes top billing. And there's also certain gray areas to consider. If you think about the current situation in Ukraine and the fallout in the Russian market, you've seen many businesses voluntarily exit Russia. However, a number of companies continue to operate in this space. If you're invested in a company that continues to maintain a physical presence or trade with Russia, that's something to consider in terms of whether this is business that you wish to continue doing, going beyond what you're legally obliged to do, but do you want to be known uh, to be supporting trade with Russia, essentially supporting the financing of the invasion of Ukraine? OK, Daniel, we're going to have to leave it there, but thank you so much for joining us on Cybos TV. That was Daniel Tannebaum, who's the partner of America's anti-financial crime practice and global head of sanctions at Oliver Wyman.